welcome Canada. And of course, the lawyers being paid to watch these shows to sue me in the past, present, or future. Tonight's episode dedicated to the lone legal student who watches the episode in like three to four weeks when I'm allowed to finally say what I want to say and says, no, 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 there's no way that actually happened. Then looked up the court file and realized, oh my God, that actually happened. And now is back watching all of these to find some perspective. Good for you, you the real MVP. Now, tonight's show, we're gonna go over everything about the presidential debate, who won, who lost, why they both won, why they both lost, how they looked amazing and terrible, and, and why you know half the country just wanted to shoot themselves after watching the whole thing. And we get to the new Canada, where we will ha be having no election because we have the holy, you know, our, our, our government is now run by dumb and dumber uh, with the NDP and the liberals making a coalition. We'll get into everything that means for Canada. Ilan Omar is caught harvesting votes, or there is a massive voter fraud scandal in her district. Um, we need to go over that and, and what it means for the election going forward, considering what Trump said about unsolicited ballots by mail. We'll go into everything we need to know about whatever it is we need to talk about. We also have Catherine McKenna, the most feminist, well, she's basically a parody of a feminist, um, you know, gets caught eating dogs and going to illegal cockfights in Indonesia. And finally, the good news of the day, uh, Yusuf Kawadawi has died. The spiritual leader of the Muslim Brotherhood is no more, and um, over the next week, it will be funny and, you know what, more interesting to see if any Canadian organizations Praise him, mourn him, defend him. Very interesting, because he's the man who legitimized suicide bombing as a duty of Muslim youth. Let's see how that one goes. Also, we'll get into some critical race theory and why it's silly. All right, Canada, a land where I don't even know what the laws are anymore. Something, 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 diversity, genders, diversity, diversity, genders, everything is free. That's basically the liberal government. But now, we have a trifecta. So, I was wrong. I thought there wouldn't be an election. I thought, you know, uh, the, the, I thought the liberals thought, would think that it's a good time for an election. I thought the conservatives wouldn't vote. But uh, the rumors I heard were incorrect. So, Daniel was wrong, and we're not, gonna have, we're not gonna have an election going on soon. And that is because of the new unholy alliance between the liberals, which are led here by Justin Trudeau, are now in bed with the NDP, led by Jagmeet Singh. So these two are very similar in a lot of different ways. Uh, one is a blathering idiot um, who with nothing of value to say. The other is a blathering idiot with nothing to say who's banned from India because of his Khalistani ties. There we go. So we can take the pictures off the screen now. The reason why we're gonna have a pretty strong liberal minority is the NDP is broke. It's the number one thing. Now, there aren't a lot of, you know, the, the chances of the election coming happened a couple months ago when the bloc was going after the liberals because the bloc was actually big enough to, you know, maybe make some noise. But the liberals just need either the bloc or the NDP to keep governing. And both the bloc and the NDP didn't have reasons to call another election. The bloc won because they're already in a pretty strong position. They had a massive resurgence. They're not going to get more seats than they have now. So the bloc really has no insensitive from a political standpoint for a new election because you know, they're benefiting quite nicely. Now, with all the COVID and the Trudeau calling everything racist and eventually calling Quebec racist, you know, things have sort of spiraled out of control. And no, it is actually Jagmeet Singh of the NDP who called, yeah, I remember this, it was a great story. A block NDP, sorry, a block MP criticized an NDP bill that called for like massive expansions of police departments uh, in a way to create a specialized police department in every police department that would monitor online hate speech. So there was a bill, and part of it, put forward by the NDP, wanted hate speech special units in every precinct across the country, and he didn't vote for it. And the only reason that Jagmeet Singh and the NDP could find was racism. That's the only reason they didn't want to massively increase police budgets to create a special force designed to monitor free citizens on the internet. Brilliant. But now the NDP and the liberals have sort of come to an accord. And this was always the danger of this liberal minority because the liberals and the NDP have, have very little difference under Justin Trudeau. My like Canada is always, you know, the always thing is like, yeah, the conservatives are a right wing party, the liberals are a centrist party, the NDP is our left. But that's never really been true. The liberals have been the left wing party, the conservatives have been a centrist party, 
and the NDP have been a far left party. Well, now Justin Trudeau is going far left. So what's really the difference between the NDP and the modern liberal party? I mean, Justin Trudeau's liberals right now are further to the left of the NDP of 2010 by far, right? You know, $50 an hour minimum wage. And then Trudeau says $15 an hour minimum wage. And, Justin Trudeau, and then Jagmeet Singh says 25. And it goes 30. It, it, it turns into a bidding. Like these aren't actual philosophical policy, you know, differences the liberals and NDP have. Their differences are how much, right? So they, they both accept the fundamental suppositions to be true, right? Canada is systemically racist. Um, you know, throw money at a problem and it goes away. Um, you know, you know, promote ministers that are incompetent. I don't know the NDP, but I just know the liberals do that. I mean, how does Seamus O'Regan even get into the parliament? Actually, just kidding. Everyone knows how Seamus O'Regan got into the cabinet. Same way Kamala Harris's political career started. All right, and here we are. So we have two far left parties. We have a far left party in the liberals. We have a far left party in the NDP with very little distinction. One's red, one's orange. We have a centrist party being dragged to the left by Aaron O'Toole and his team of red Tories. Don't, don't worry, guys. Aaron O'Toole is a true blue conservative. That's why I hired Patrick Brown's entire campaign staff, the truest and bluest of all Tories, Patrick Brown, Mr. Carbon Tax himself. So we have Aaron O'Toole you know, dragging the, the centrist party into the left. We have Justin Trudeau making an alliance with the far left party to go even further left. We also have a green party, and their job is just to be like, trees good, Jews bad, socialism. That's, you know, that's essentially what the greens are there to do. And the media goes, oh my God, it's so amazing. What a wealth of amazing candidates the green party has. Look, one of them's a lawyer, woo. And the other one, you know, you know humped a tree or something. What a, what a great party that is. But the problem is, you actually have a very strong ideological coalition running Canada. So in terms of the corruption stuff, yeah, maybe it'll be hard to get away with something like SNC-Lavalin because when there's things like the Wee scandal, the NDP, there will be some people inside there that want to sort of hammer the liberals on corruption to make themselves look better in the next election. But that's really the only sort of balance of power we have is sort of, you know, the ability to enforce irrelevant scandals. However, Justin Trudeau has shown that he'll just shut down Parliament for a month if he's in the middle of one of these scandals, and no one will really do anything about that. And his, his political cal calculation was actually pretty good right here. It was, I own the media because I'm paying them $600 million. I kind of own them before I even paid them. Um, right now, the Conservatives have some momentum on the Wee Scandal thing. So let's just shut down democracy for a month. You know, let's stop all the bad press coverage about me. Remember, we did the show, and I, and I was saying, this is now the media's test. This is the media's test. Justin Trudeau has challenged the media, or it's not even so much a challenge, but sort of publicly declared, I am your daddy, to CTV, CBC, Global News. He said, uh, he said, I'm your daddy, and you don't talk bad about daddy, so shut up. And those vaunted journalists, you know, the, 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 the vaunted fourth estate and all that, they said, yes, daddy. We're sorry to have said bad things about you. Are you okay? We're gonna, for the next day or two, we'll write we scandal stuff, but then we'll go back to orange man bad and Trump, 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 and Trump, 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 and then it all went away. And then when they came back to parliament, are we gonna go back to the we scandal? Are we gonna do, or the media gonna do the whole, oh, well, I guarantee you this. I, I, I've watched enough CBC over the last few years that I already know what the CBC coverage is going to be. So I'm going to spoil it for you the CBC coverage of the, of the Wee Scandal. They're going to do the thing where they don't cover the Wee Scandal, they cover the politics surrounding the Wee Scandal. And this is how Justin Trudeau will get away with it. Because they will cover not what he did being illegal, they will cover the move of not talking about it for a month and seeing if it was wise and it worked. So instead of saying, you know what, he shut down you know, all this discussion, and we're journalists, and we have to find the truth, and there was corruption here, and we need to get to the bottom of who was corrupt, what did they do, people resigned, hundreds of millions of dollars was on the line, integrity's on the line, where was the money going, who was it coming to, where are the journalists, we're going to get to the truth. Instead of doing that, which is what a journalist will do, uh, they will take the cheerleader role, and they'll do it in a way that sort of maintains their false illusion of, in, of objectivity. It'll be done like this. They'll do things like, well, yes, the conservatives are talking about the Wee Scandal, and the conservatives are trying to revive the Wee Scandal. That will be the narrative. The conservatives are trying to revive the Wee Scandal. Then they'll go into, was it a clever move by Justin Trudeau politically 
to prorogue Parliament at that time. Did it help him get out of the Wee scandal? Let's look at that. Well, okay, it looks like here's the polling data around the Wee. Canadians seem less concerned about the Wee scandal over the last three weeks, so therefore it worked. That, that, that takes out all the factors saying it only worked because you did what daddy told you to do and you stopped saying mean things about Justin Trudeau and you stopped looking for the truth. Now that the Conservatives are finally allowed to talk again and then they continue their talking points from a month ago, they're going to play the narrative that, oh, the Conservatives are trying to revive the scandal. Is it working? You know, what does the polling data say? What are Canadians thinking about it on a very baseline level? Again, they won't do the SNC-Lavalin thing. Well, they, I mean, they won't do the thing they didn't do in this SNC-Lavalin thing of getting into the weeds of the discussion and actually explaining it. So this is how Canada operates now. You have the Liberals and the NDP forming an ideological co coalition run on rainbows and, 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 and a feeling. And, you know, I guess, you know, their mutual love of Calistani extremism. Who knows? Right? That's the, the Liberal NDP. You can't even tell who's red and who's orange. You have two people who are pretty much the same, although Jagmeet is more articulate and, to his credit, has a law degree. Uh, I, I don't know if he understood anything in law school, but he, he has a degree. You know, Justin Trudeau is a snowboard instructor. Both of them are champagne socialists. Jagmeet Singh is probably, like, the best leader for the NDP ever. Like, I, I mean, I was saying before, if I could magically decide the outcome of the election, you know, you know it would have been 337 seats for, I don't know, just despite... Andrew Scheer, the, I don't know, we give it to the Conservatives and PPC or whatever, so we have a right-wing coalition, a power balance there, and then Jagmeet Singh would win a seat. I would never take a, a seat away from I would keep Jagmeet Singh in Canadian Parliament forever. I think Jagmeet Singh is a godsend to Canada. Why? Because the NDP is a danger to Canada, and Jagmeet Singh has done a great job of destroying the NDP. No, like, listen, if you don't like the NDP, if you think the NDP is a dangerous, you know, socialist, extremist enabling organization. I have no evidence to offer to the contrary, but you should love Jagmeet Singh because Jagmeet Singh has been the greatest thing because he's pitted the NDP base against the NDP. I've gone over this, but just, just to explain. Jagmeet Singh is a champagne socialist, right? He's the type of guy who will like be in GQ and show you his Rolex. I'm not wearing a Rolex, but just imagine he's like, ooh, I got Rolexes and fancy suits. And he's in GQ talking about like, the poor, and this, like, this is the socialist. Like, this is Justin Trudeau. Like, my daddy was prime minister, and his daddy was an oil tycoon. Right, but the rich people are the problem. Right, so these are the same guys. But Jagmeet Singh is so amazing, because the NDP actually has, like, a working class base. Right, it started as a workers' party. Canada had some balance, and, and, you know, the union guys. You know, you go to the guys, and you say, hey, you know, we work really hard, we got jobs, you know, we gotta, we gotta make ends meet. I got a wife, I got a family, I got a, you know, a couple kids, they wanna go to school, they wanna go to hockey practice. I need this, I need my benefits, I need someone to protect the worker. That's the heart of the NDP, right? And to the extent those people are the heart of the country. Right? Remember when Rex Murphy said, you know, the middle class is great and the left was like, he wants everyone to die. No, the working class is the backbone of the Canadian economy. No one debates this, everyone likes them. Well, not everyone. Jagmeet Singh got in. And then he did the whole, you know, well, this isn't what the NDP is about, right? That was Jack Layton, Tom Mulcair. Jagmeet Singh came in, and he basically did the identity politics thing, right? He's like, okay, who's the real future of this party? Is it the union worker, the guy who works, you know, 10 hours a day in the sun, hard labor to, to, to raise a family? Is that the heart of our party? I mean, that's what we built on. Or... Is it a 20-year-old college girl who just took a class in gender studies? And Jagmeet said, well, it's going to be the 20-year-old college girl who knows nothing, doesn't vote, and just took a, uh, a gender studies course. So when Jagmeet Singh adapted the sort of critical race theory, we'll go into later, and like the Canada is evil, white, white supremacist, and all the Canadians are bad, some of those union guys I just talked about, some of those guys who work out there, like not all of them, but some of them are white people. I know, shocking. And uh, white people generally don't like it when you spew anti-white rhetoric as a political platform. It turns them off. Same way black people don't like it when you spew anti-black racism as a political platform. The same way insert group here doesn't like it when you insert group X, right? It makes sense. So Jagmeet Singh completely destroyed the base of his party. He started internal conflict. That's why the NDP is broke. So the NDP actually has no chance to even, they can't even afford another election, which is another reason why the liberals can totally leverage them. 
So if you think the NDP are going to be a legitimate bulwark against liberal, cor liberal corruption, um, you got another thing coming. Because the NDP is $10 million in debt. They don't have the money. They don't physically have the ability to run another election. So the future of Canada is it's Justin Trudeau with a side of Justin Trudeau in brown face. Or Jagmeet Singh, whatever you want to call it. I have a friend who calls him Justinder Trudinder. I like that. All right. So the story that is taking everyone by storm is the American presidential debate. Oh boy, was that something. You know, more entertaining than Canadian politics. I mean, I don't think anyone can debate or legitimately even debate. What is the more entertaining uh, country? Is it America or is it Canada? Right, we had one debate in Canada. Justin Trudeau skipped out of all the other ones. There's one English debate. You know, it was all these different people. You know, it had like you know five participants and it had like seven moderators. It was a ridiculous affair. This is a ridiculous affair on another thing. So Chris Wallace and uh, Joe Biden debated Donald Trump last night, and there are a lot of different takeaways that people can have. Um, if you watched our live stream on the National Telegraph. You saw, uh, you saw what we said, but I'm just going to recap some of the biggest moments and, and what you need to sort of know. So who won? Both of them can declare victory, and they both lost. And Chris Wallace. I think Chris Wallace is the only clear loser of the debate because Chris Wallace's integrity took a massive hit when he started debating Donald Trump. And so we'll just go over Chris Wallace. So Chris Wallace is the moderator. Um, before the debate, he said he would hold Biden to account and make him answer the question of whether or not he would pack the Supreme Court. He did not hold him to account. I think Trump tried to, which was a good Trump interruption there. Uh, but Trump's good interruptions were, you know, undercut by his many bad interruptions. So Chris Wallace wouldn't hold Joe Biden to account. And then he was badgering Donald Trump on climate change. And the questions, of course, the framing on all the questions were ridiculous to Trump. But regardless, Donald Trump did make some mistakes as well as Joe Biden. So Biden's big victory, and I said this in the pregame coverage and I said in the postgame coverage, is it was the same thing as Donald Trump in 2016. Hillary Clinton's campaign it was trying to paint a picture that Donald Trump is so incredibly unstable that if you even take him on the debate stage, he can't go an hour and a half without taking his pants off and you know, firing you know, guns into the audience trying to shoot all the immigrants. You know, if we take Donald Trump to the debate stage, he's such a fool, he's going to take his pants off, then use his pants to sort of, you know, strangle a bunch of minorities because that's what Donald Trump did. Then when Donald Trump got up there, didn't take his pants off, instead said things that kind of were making sense, you know, he, you know, he jumped over the very low expectations. So he got a boost by not actually winning those debates with Hillary Clinton on a substance level, but by winning them on a perception level. That's sort of reversed here uh, in 2020. So as Hillary Clinton was, you know, more knowledgeable about the political infrastructure and, you know, political dealings than Donald Trump. Now, you can disagree with her philosophy, which I did, and you can disagree with her human, is she human? Her inhuman, her lizard emotions, her, her just generally being a horrible person. Hillary was a horrible person. Right? Bill was a horrible person. They did horrible things. They were involved in hor with horrible people. Right? So Donald Trump smacking her was, was good. Right? The opposite was sort of true in 2020. Donald Trump, if you watch the debate, was sort of bias taken out. Donald Trump won that debate. In the same way that Hillary Clinton won them in 2016, though. And Biden won because Donald Trump tried to paint Joe Biden. And to the extent I've been guilty in this, too, you know, we've all talked about Joe Biden's gaffe moments, right? With the, po the points where Joe Biden is either, you know, the clips that the right is putting out is Joe Biden either sniffing a child or the child looks mortified and is like, please stop sniffing me. And then he's like... <sighs> Oh, yeah, yeah. And you're like, what's going on, right? That's creepy, Joe Biden. But the good thing for Joe Biden is COVID-19, you know, all the kids legitimately have to stay away from him. So the kids can be like, no, 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 I can't be near you because if there was no COVID-19, Joe Biden would be out there sniffing your kids in Michigan somewhere. The other thing on Joe Biden is, is Joe Biden even alive right now? And I've made those jokes. Like, you know, it's, you know, weekend at Bernie's, you know, part three, right? We're all talking about, how Biden's being propped up, Kamala Harris is really the president. You even had the clip of a Harris administration featuring Joe Biden. So by Joe Biden just understanding what country he was in, understanding who he was on stage with, understanding his own name, you know, answering the questions in a way that related to the question, he looked like he didn't have Alzheimer's, which was a big win for him. Right? So that's the danger of sort of setting the bar too low on your opponent. All right, so by Joe Biden just being alive, he kind of won. And by Donald Trump, 
you know, setting that up, that's where he kind of lost. Now, Donald Trump did come out of there with a lot of sort of things that the right can take away and sort of hammer on to make Joe Biden look more radical. Joe Biden could not condemn Antifa. He said Antifa is just an idea, it's not an organization. Like, tell that to all the rioting there. Like, clearly, you know, there's violence on the street coming from these groups, and he can't condemn that, right? So, sort of tacit support for Antifa. The big one, the biggest one is really, he would not commit to not packing the Supreme Court. So, we'll go back to that. And the, and the third one is he, he basically called America systemically racist. Um, there, was, there was a couple other great moments, like, you know, when he said the Green New Deal will pay for itself. Yes, the, the, the $100 trillion plan to, to get rid of farting cows and all of the airplanes will just pay for itself. It, the voodoo economics of the left it drove me insane. Um, but bringing back to the not packing the Supreme Court, we talked about this, right? If Donald Trump appoints, you know, he's already appointed, Amy Comey Barrett is, is going to be there, so it'd be, you know, six to three. Will Joe Biden add more, add two more Supreme Court justices? So will Joe Biden just say, okay, the Supreme Court, it's nine, we're just saying it's 11 now. So it's now, we're, I'm moving it from 9 to 11, and then I'm going to appoint two more judges, right? He wouldn't name the type of judges he's considering, um, and he wouldn't, um, you know, uh, commit to not packing the Supreme Court. That's two big things, right? And Trump was really good on badgering him there to get an answer. However, this is sort of the cried wolf phenomenon. Because Donald Trump was constantly interrupting, Instead of doing, if he had done it two to three times at the two to three points where it was really relevant, like if, if he had sort of saved his first interruption was when Joe Biden wouldn't answer the question about packing the Supreme Court and Donald Trump showed that, no, 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 I'm going to make this a thing. And if we turn this into a debate clip, oh, look at Donald Trump interrupting and they play, play this clip, I win because the more people who see this clip of him failing to, to, uh, to distance himself from packing the Supreme Court, he'll seem more radical and I will win. Right? That's a good interruption. Right? The fact that he was interrupting, like, no, lies, bad, very bad. You know, so, some of it was really funny. Like, when Donald Trump would just say, well, now you lost the left. That was hilarious, okay? Productive? Maybe not. Hilarious? Most definitely. And there were great points. He was like, oh, so you don't support the Green New Deal? Well, you just lost the left wing of your party. And funny. So those are the big sort of victories for Donald Trump. Um, now, what are we going to focus on? I had said at the time, you know, just live, I said, okay, I see, I see the clip the Democratic Party is going to be making in the next few days. Um, expect them, to, maybe he's getting a few, expect them to make him look crazy by going after, like, Chris Wallace, using, using that sort of tactic of he's so unusual, he's so irregular, just showing Chris Wallace's frustrations with Donald Trump. Um, that might be the Democratic attack ad. Uh, this might backfire because, again, there is no one that I know of outside of Joe Biden, maybe his wife, Jill Biden, who is voting for Joe Biden. I don't know of a single person in America outside those two who are voting for Joe Biden. Now, people will vote for Joe Biden, but they're more likely voting against Donald Trump. The 99% of the Democrats are voting against Donald Trump. Joe Biden's voting for Joe Biden. Joe Biden's wife, I think, is voting for Joe Biden. Kamala Harris isn't voting for Joe Biden. She's voting for Kamala Harris you know, after Joe Biden, you know, gets into office and then she can kick him out. So I really don't know who's voting for him. And, and this can really hurt him because Joe Biden didn't create any enthusiasm. Now, we'll see if, he can, if his campaign can clip together um, 30 seconds of him looking tough and him like, oh, shut up, man. Um, that has some potential risks and, and drawbacks there. So if they do try and push Biden as is like, oh, look at him standing up to Trump. Look at him fighting back. Look at him. He's also a puncher. You might detract from Joe Biden's appeal, which is, I'm basically half dead, and I'm the moderate bulwark against the insanity of the, the far left of my party. And Joe Biden kind of understood this, because Joe Biden did the Justin Trudeau thing, but, you know, he did it in a way as like, I am the Democratic Party. I am the Democratic Party. Which, in any other year would play really horribly against him, saying, I am the Democratic Party. If Trump said, I am the Republican Party, you, I can, you all know that CNN 
and, and, and MSNBC would be going ballistic right now, saying, oh, he's a dictator, he doesn't respect parliamentary democracy, he thinks he controls the Senate, he thinks he controls the House, he thinks he controls the Supreme Court, he's saying he's a Republican Party, everyone must uh, condemn him, this is unusual, the norms, oh, the norms, please save us from the norms. Right, that would be happening. But because it was Joe Biden, radio silence. So, you know, a few other uh, points we're going to get into. Um, you know, I said Joe Biden's Green New Deal. This is where Trump sort of needs to save up his interruptions and save up his belligerence here. Because he, Joe Biden said, you know, oh, the Green New Deal, you know, it's, it's uh, you know, it will pay for itself. But I don't support it. Right? This would be a great time for Donald Trump to sort of interject. If he hadn't been doing a lot of interjections, they'd have more weight where he could just make fun of Joe. So he's like, so wait, there's a plan that will pay for itself, but you don't support it? Why not? And he goes, well, look at this. He could just say, well, I looked at it, and I don't think it will support it, uh, pay for itself, but you say it will. So how does it pay for itself? And if it does pay for itself, why are you against it? Like, you know, that's, <laughs> I mean, that's good governance. If there's a plan that will pay for itself, you know, and it's not like the baby murder plan, do it up, you know, get at him. But no, you know, that's, you know, he needs to sort of drive him closer to AOC. Um, and there were, so the big attack being used against Trump right now is he didn't condemn white supremacy and he told the Proud Boys to stand by, which was ridiculous because if you read the transcript of, of how that went down, you know, they're really, um, like, it, it was really, really ridiculous. And like, are we really gonna go back to the thing of like Trump won't condemn white supremacy again? Donald Trump has condemned white supremacy. Donald Trump does condemn white supremacy. Um, but, you know, he, he just gave the thing. Okay, I don't have it here. But how the exchange went is, you know, Chris Wallace asked like, will you, with the violence, you know, will you condemn white supremacy? And Donald Trump says, sure, he'll condemn white supremacy. And, like groups, and then he sort of asks, what do you mean by white supremacist groups? Clarify. Joe Biden says, and, so Chris Wallace has said, will you tell them to stand down and stand down? You know, will you tell white supremacist groups to stand down? He's like, what do you mean? What are you talking about? And Joe Biden says, the Proud Boys. And Donald Trump goes, yeah, sure. The Proud Boys should stand down, which was basically uh, answering the question in the way they did that. And then the media is dishonestly framing it. Did, did Donald Trump just tell the Proud Boys to stand down? Is he like the active leader of the Proud Boys? And it's like, no, he just answered the stupid question you asked him. Now, loaded question to be sure, but this is what the media is going to focus on is so the Proud Boys. So this is where Trump can win, though, because when Trump gets down into the mud and Trump gets dirty, right, he can bring everyone down to his level, which is one of his skills, right? The, the you know, Joe Biden, like, I'm Joe Biden and I'm boring. Right? He can bring him down into a mudslinging fight. He's like, oh, you're corrupt. He'll be like, well, what's your son Hunter Biden getting $3.5 million from a Ukrainian, uh, from a, sorry, a Russian oligarch? And Joe Biden's like, that report's been discredited. By whom? Who's discredited? Like, Joe Biden is just like a pathological liar. Like, not Hillary level, like evil, cackling, maniacal liar, but more just like, you know, he's been in politics for 50 years. He can just lie on command. And to be honest, you know, when you're up against Donald Trump, no one's going to really fact check anything you're saying. So, you know, Biden was able to get away with that. Um, but dragging Biden into this sort of fight does two things. One, it dirties Biden's image. And two, it connects him to his radical faction, which is Antifa. And Trump was right when he said, you know, most of the violence, most of the street violence is coming from the far left these days. It doesn't mean the white supremacists aren't evil. Like, no, white supremacists are very evil, right? But you know, Joe Biden can't condemn Antifa. Which is going to bring us to our next thing, is when Donald Trump was asked to condemn white supremacy, considering he was already asked about critical race theory beforehand, and, you know, why you want to ban it, and Chris Wallace was defending critical race theory, Donald Trump had a perfect, perfect answer to the white supremacy thing. And if he had said this and just dropped it there, it would have been a huge mic drop moment, and it would have been great. It, it, would, it, it would have won him the debate had he said this. Of course I'll condemn white supremacy. It's a faction of critical race theory, and I don't think, you know, and I disagree. All you have to do is say, yeah, white supremacy is evil. It follows the thinking of critical race theory, which is why it's bad, and just drop it at that. Right, well, why is it? Well, it focuses on race, and we get into it. So I'm going to do what Donald Trump should have, and we're going to do a, a breakdown of critical race theory. So here is one of the best tweets of all time. I'll just sort of set it up. 
Uh, then, then we'll go to a video that does it better. Um, so here you have Richard Spencer, uh, noted alt-writer, the founder of the alt-right, saying, not wrong. Who's he gr agreeing with here? Ibrahim X. Kennedy, the author of How to Be an Anti-Racist, a man who gets paid tens of thousands of dollars to lecture universities on diversity and hiring. One of the thought, thought leaders in the critical race movement. Now, I'm sure a lot of you have seen this video, but I think it's very important. And, you know, when the leader of the white supra of the alt-right and the leader of the anti-racist movement literally agree that interracial adoption is bad and shouldn't be done, Let's see, uh, let's, let's just see the video that Ryan Long made a few months ago, just showing exactly what's going on here. When me and Brad first met, I didn't think we'd get along, but turns out we kind of agree on everything. Your, Your racial, racial identity is the most important thing. thing. Everything, everything should be looked at through the lens of race. race. Jinx, you owe me a Coke. Damn. We both have a lot of opinions about people of color, even though we barely know any. I say colored people, but as long as we're classifying them, we both think minorities are a united group who think the same and act the same. And vote the same. You don't want to lose your black card. Sorry, I don't know. I just think we should roll, roll back, back discrimination laws so we can hire based on race again. Jinx, now you owe me a Coke. Hey, tell them what you told me yesterday. White actors should only do voices for white cartoon characters. Been saying that for years. Stick to your own. Us white people, we have so much privilege. I agree. It is a privilege to be white. Ask him about interracial dating. All I said is that black men who date white women have internalized racism, and white men that date ethnic women are fetishizing them. Guys against interracial dating now. Like, am I being pranked? Did Boomer put you up to this? Ugh, you know that taco place is white owned? White people should be making white foods like Kraft macaroni and cheese, no seasoning, not even salt. It's like he's a mind reader. I mean, I've been pushing for segregation forever and my man does what? I created an improv comedy show exclusively for ethnic people. Guy segregates comedy on my birthday. White people need to stop wearing dreadlocks and they need to stop appropriating black people's music. Shaved heads and country music, the way God intended. You know all white people are racist. I'm listening. Even if you have a black wife or a black friend group, you're still really racist. You know, he just kicked a guy out of the organization for having a black girlfriend, but if you can promise me he's still really racist, we'll consider letting him back in. Black people should only shop at black businesses. I guess the only thing we really disagree about is I think white people are the root of all evil. But what did I tell you, though? If we can narrow that down to a certain group of tiny-hatted white people, I think we can come to an understanding. Technically, I don't consider Jewish people white Neither do I. But we're still cool with interracial cucking, right? Yeah, as long as you pay for it. Sex work should be celebrated. All right. So that's basically the love affair between Ibrahim X. Kennedy and Richard Spencer, noted anti-racist and white nationalist. By the way, follow Ryan Long on Twitter and YouTube and Instagram or whatever, just so, you know, he doesn't copyright strike this video. Please, Ryan, we're big fans. Um, now, the reason... Uh, now, let's be fair to Ibrahim X. Kennedy here. There, there might be two potential reasons why he made that tweet against interracial adoption. Uh, we have to set the context up. So at the time, we had learned that Justice Amy Coney Barrett has seven children. Two of them are adopted from Haiti. So five of her kids are white and two of them are black. This is the context that sets up the conversation about interracial adoption. Now, Ibrahim X. Kennedy says it's a form of colonialism. You're colonizing the kids to think with their whiteness and against the blackness. Hard position to take, you know, against interracial adoption these days, but he did it, so good for him. Now, reason one, the charitable reason, the the reason that, that I just want to give him an out here, you know, because reason number two he did that is because Ibrahim X. Kennedy is a racist with bad ideas who's against interracial adoption because he's a bad person with bad ideas. Option number two. Option numero uno. Maybe he's just an obstinate political hack. Right? Maybe that's what the sort of, you see the Trump derangement syndrome going on in the media. A lot of the pushback to Donald Trump isn't based on any sort of morality or ideology. It's obstinance. And you see that from all sides of the political spectrum in many different countries, right? The guy who's on the team color you, you like, he says that it's right. The guy with the team color you don't like says it and you're against it. So maybe he just saw that, oh, Amy Comey Barrett adopted black kids and I don't like her because she's a conservative justice who you know is a you know from all 
you know, from, from everything we've heard, that she's a bit more of the Scalia tree of, you know, you know, a constitutional, you know, treats the Constitution and the law as what is written in the law and a big fan of due process. I know, crazy client. A, a judge who believes that the law is the law and due process is, is integral to it? I know, radical, radical beliefs by Amy Coney Barrett there. So maybe Ibrahim X. Kennedy was just saying, huh, you know, Amy Coney Barrett did this thing, and I, as a political operative, because I hate Trump so much, need to make this thing where she adopted two children and brought them out of Haiti, raised them and loved them as her own, and gave them a better life, maybe I can turn this into a bad thing. And so he did. And you know who agreed that white people shouldn't be adopting black children, and black children shouldn't be adopting white children, and everyone should stick to their races? The alt-right! The literal founder of the alt-right agreed with the fact that, yes, white people should not adopt black babies. Now, I'm not going to explain why this is profoundly evil, because most of the audience here knows racism bad. But I just love, I would love to see, and here's, here's the argument to defeat this. I would love to see Ibrahim X. Kennedy and friends, and everyone who liked and retweeted that, I'm pretty, I don't, I don't even know, and I'm just going to assume Sean King did, the, the white guy pretending to be black, saying, you know, black people and white people shouldn't be adopting white and black kids. I'm just assuming that's something he would like. What would we say if it was not race, but instead sexuality? What if we said, um, what if uh, Amy Coney Barrett said, you know, gay people shouldn't be adopting straight kids because it's a form of gay colonialism or whatever the hell Ibrahim X. Kennedy said, right? What if we said, you know, straight people should not be allowed to adopt gay children. No gay, you know, if a gay child is homeless, you know, let's say there's a gay orphan, you know, he's 11, you know, he's been orphaned, he's already openly gay, and, um, you know, his, the people down the street, you know, who his parents were close with, they like him, and they want to adopt him, but they're straight. You know, it's a man and a woman, and they want to bring him into their family. Is that a form of straight colonialism? What type of insane person would be against that family adopting the 11-year-old gay kid? Or reverse it. Let's say a kid from a heterosexual family, you know, uh, is a heterosexual kid. Parents die in a car crash. He's 10. They're, they were really close to this couple down the street. They happen to be gay or lesbian. They try and adopt the kid. Would Ibrahim X. Kennedy be like, no, 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 they can't adopt that kid. It's a form of gay colonialism. Like, come on, guys. Like, can we get better arguments, please? Can we, or, or arguments that aren't like, that I at least have to work to debunk. Because I didn't even need to Google anything reminded to, re remotely, you know, to prove that argument wrong. Like, I, I literally spent no time. It's like, yeah, no, no, um, racism bad, and no, adopting kids is not evil. Pretty easy. All right, so moving off that. What, we, what we've learned in, in, uh, in, our, in our time together here is I love the government, and... I love all the social justice, insane, nonsense rhetoric they spit out. And who is a better example of vapid, useless rhetoric than our very own Catherine McKenna? So let's see what Catherine McKenna was up to this week or years ago. Oh, yes, watch. Catherine McKenna caught eating dog meat and going to a legal cockfighting ring in Indonesia. Now, I get the argument to be made that, hey, we eat cows, we eat pigs. What's the difference between a dog? Different cultures. You don't want to go into that. Like, I'm not going to hold it against someone eating a dog. I would never do it. I, raised, I was raised in North America. We love dogs. I want to pet a puppy. I don't want to eat a puppy. I find the, the, the thought of eating dogs, you know, a, disturbing mentally. But I can understand, okay, you want to eat a dog. I'm not going to go after you for that. There are worse things Catherine McKenna has done than eat a dog, right? Throw that away as a cultural experience, Catherine. But bribing her way into an illegal cockfighting ring so the way these things work is uh, they basically, they starve these roosters. Um, they put razors on their beaks and claws and they have them fight to the death and then they're both killed afterwards. Seems a bit barbaric. Um, now, again, Catherine McKenna is 24. She's traveling Indonesia. Her and her friends want to go see a cockfighting uh, thing for the experience or whatever. Okay, fine. You know, I can, I can even take the apology there, and I was young and dumb, and it was wrong, and we just wanted a cultural experience, mea culpa. 
However, this is not Catherine McKenna. Catherine McKenna doesn't apologize. Catherine McKenna doesn't admit she's wrong. Catherine McKenna declares you sexist and then continues on with her day. This is my problem with Catherine McKenna, is Catherine McKenna is a parody of a feminist made by a misogynist jerk from the 1980s. This is it. There was a Wall Street guy in the 1980s who was really misogynist, you know, sexually harassed all of his secretaries, thinks women are half of what men are. He decided to make a comic book parodying a woman in politics to parody the idea that a woman in a position of power is so outlandish and ridiculous, and here's how it would look. That is Catherine McKenna. And it's a, it's a real shame, because she's setting feminism back 30 years. And we do have competent women in this country. Lots of competent women in power. You had the Conservative Party run by R Ronna Ambrose, right? You have, Chris, you, you have Christia Freeland, who, listen, I have problems with Christia Freeland's ideology, but my problem with Christia Freeland isn't that she's like a fool and incompetent, it's that her, fund, her ideology is fundamentally flawed. And a lot, of, uh, um, a lot of Christia Freeland's problems are is she has to then, you know, represent the views of this government, which is Justin Trudeau. And if you have to defend Justin Trudeau, you're already behind the eight ball. So that's not, Catherine Mc, sorry, Christa Freeland is not incompetent. I disagree with her. I think she's mishandled files, but those come from, you know, ideological frameworks we have in the universe and in the world that, that are different. So she's not an idiot, I just disagree with her. Jody, uh, Jody Wilson-Rabel, Jane Philpott, two of the, well, Jane Philpott was an excellent health minister, then they moved her to minister of like second indigenous, whatever. Great integrity, strong woman, stood up for what was right, stood up for her friend Jody Wilson-Rabel when, when, she, when she, you know, basically did her like heroic last stand there. Competent women, strong women. Did Catherine McKenna defend them? No, never. Right? Catherine McKenna turned tail on them when Justin Trudeau kicked him out. So Catherine McKenna is sort of, uh, right? And every time Catherine McKenna trends for doing something, like losing half of the infrastructure funding, she's the infrastructure minister and she's misplaced tens of billions of dollars. Misplaced billions of dollars. How do you misplace billions of dollars? She just can't find billions of dollars. That's not a, oh, women suck at politics thing. That's a, you suck at your job, you're incompetent. And Justin Trudeau set this thing up. Because when, when 2015 hit and he asked, you know, what are the qualifications? You know, you gender balance the cabinet, whoopee. Like, what's the reasoning? He's like, well, because it's 2015. So Catherine McKenna's qualifications for Minister of Infrastructure seem to be it was the year 2015. Is there anything else to justify her getting that position? Did she do a rockin' job as, you know, environment minister? Did she, you know, manufacture new uh, drink box, water bottle type sort of thingies? Is that Catherine McKenna's great idea? No. So my frustrations though with Catherine McKenna are, are, are this. She has some flaws in her past, right? Eating a dog, going to a legal cockfighting ring. All of these could be excused had she not been, for years now, a completely, you know, ideologically strident, moralizing jerk. That's Catherine McKenna. Because Catherine McKenna was part of this whole green movement, right, when she was climate Barbie, of, we're so morally pure. I always do the right thing. Make better choices, Canadians. It's not hard. You know, I go biking it. And, and portraying yourself as like this wonderful, most virtuous person, well, degrading any type of Canadian who didn't disagree with her as either racist, sexist, misogynist, climate denier, stupid, right? She had the worst things to say about her detractors. Right? Well, putting up this great moral front. Well, it turns out when you were in your 20s, you are in Indonesia going to cockfights and eating dogs. So, you know, those in glass houses, Catherine. Right? But every time Catherine McKenna turns on Twitter, the entire, you know, liberal army gets on there and says, this is misogyny, misogyny. It's not misogyny. If you're the infrastructure minister and you misplace billions of dollars, if you literally cannot find tens of billions of dollars of taxpayer money, if it just went kaploo, into the ether, gonzo, not, not doing anything for the country, just whoops, where did it go, numbers on a page, can't find it, then you're incompetent. And that's not sexist, that's straight incompetence, right? I, you know, the most incompetent minister in Trudeau's government isn't even a woman, Seamus O'Regan. And we all know, actually, I know how he got his job in uh, parliament. Um, so, that's my frustrations with Catherine McKenna and team. All right.
field good news the thing, the, the timer stopped, so I'm not sure how much time I have, but we're going to do it anyway. We'll do Ilan Omar's stuff. Vote fixing. Then we'll get to the Muslim Brotherhood. I know, what's the difference? Vote fixing in uh, Minnesota. Now, what you're seeing here is, you know, massive, massive, what looks like potential voter fraud um, on a pretty wide scale in the 6th Ward of Minnesota District. And you have, from Project Veritas, footage that they say is, you know, the start of, um, you know, just the start of what they're covering. There's footage of them talking to, uh, it was a Jamal Osman, a city councilor there, how he's basically, you'll see the thing from Project Veritas, we can link to it, just, he has a card full of ballots, they're exchanging money for uh, absentee ballots, and, and what is essentially happening in Minnesota here is, is you have political operatives taking advantage of the Somali community. And listen, this is not a story of, ugh, those Somalis. This is a story of what happens when you don't integrate people into your country and you don't have strong values and you don't give immigrants something to latch on to. Because what's happening is a Somali community just happens to be there, there just happens to be some poor governance, and they're being taken advantage of and, and, and screwed around with by bad political operatives. Listen, sleazy political operatives come in all shapes and sizes. I myself did a report on David Parker, Aaron O'Toole's National Director of Field Operations, and all the crazy things he was saying, and how he claimed to be a political assassin, and how he you know, was bragging about doing dirty politics. He was a straight white male, for all, all I know. Right? He was bragging about how much female attention this got him, so I'm assuming he's a straight white male, because he's male, and he's white, bragging about the chicks that being a jerk got him, right? Sleazy stuff happens in the Canadian Conservative Party. He wasn't the only one. I'm sure Peter McKay had sleaze bags, and Leslin Lewis had sleaze bags, and Derek Sloan had sleaze bags, and Justin Trudeau has sleaze bags of all different shapes and sizes. They're so multicultural. You got a, you know, a Calistani sleaze bag, a white sleaze bag, a transgender sleaze bag, you know, um, a gay, disabled, Muslim, native, super transgender sleaze, you know, sleaze bag. You know, all types of different things. You know, this is, you know, Politics attracts sleaze bags. All right, that's that's the point here. But what you have in Minnesota and what's going on is, you have sort of towers and ma massive apartment buildings with there's a lot of senior citizens, and you just have people representing the small, you know, claiming to represent the smaller community and different things, going and collecting these old people's ballots and essentially filling them out themselves. You know, mailing them in, and then oh, everyone in that building voted for Elon Omar. Amazing, right? Or younger people who are more with it are just sort of being bribed for their ballots, right? You've seen, there was an exchange that they caught in terms of cash for ballots. So the reason why this is, you know, I'm, I'm putting this on the lack of integration thing is, these Somali immigrants are being taken advantage of because they come from a country, Somalia, which does not have a strong democratic institutions in it. Now, you can, we can talk about Somalia and we can talk about, you know, Europeans exploiting their fishing and their coast, destroying the industry there, which essentially turned them to piracy and, and all this. We can talk about all that. You know, we can go watch Black Hawk Down together and, and, and go through the whole thing. But what is not debatable is right now, for the last couple decades, Somalia has not been a model of global stability. They do not have strong democratic institutions. So the people who tend to come from Somalia are not familiar with the intricacies of a functioning democracy which make them more prone to sleazebags and fraudsters, which again, there will be Somali sleazebags and fraudsters. There will also be white sleazebags and fraudsters. There's a Republican Somali sleazebag fraudster in Boston right now. I don't know that, but like, I'm just like, you get my point, right? But when you have these communities that you just fail to integrate, you don't do anything, and you just leave them to sort of, oh, you know, they're Somali and, and or this, and you just sort of leave them alone. You don't give them the, hey, this is America, this is Canada, this is how we are. You know, do you want to be Canadian? Do you want to be American? This is what's in it, right? Fully integrating them, making them feel Canadian, because if they felt Canadian or American, it'd be a lot harder to come and take advantage of them. Like, I have a grandmother in a retirement facility. If someone tried to defraud that retirement facility and came in and said, no, no, I'm collecting your votes, they'd be like, well, no, this isn't the way it's gone for the last 90 years, right? You have a retirement home full of Canadians who would say, wait, wait, this isn't usually how it goes. They'd call their sons or their grandkids and say, hey, there was a man here and he said this, right? 
it's harder to do. But when you don't integrate these communities, you leave them open to predators. And it doesn't benefit them. Like, you just turn them into prey, right? You, you, you enhance political corruption in their districts. The political corruption leads to, to you know, you know, politics of, of group and race. And that tends to promote the people at the top who, who will play to these issues. And these issues only get play if they're never solved. So you have people at the top incentivized to have the community fail so they could then be the representatives of the community getting a fair deal and all this government funding to correct all the racism that's supposedly happening there. It, it's just a really bad, bad situation brought on by the, the sort of the, the failure to make these people feel American or Canadian, which is why integration is a good thing. Now, final story of the day and our feel-good story of the day. So if you're watching at home, give someone you love a high five, if you're husband and wife, you know, high five your wife, high five your husband, because Yusuf Karwadawi is d -d -d dead. I know, happy times all around. Now, before you say, oh, Daniel, we shouldn't be celebrating the death of... No, screw this terrorist. Yusuf Karadawi was so insane. Right? This was the spiritual leader of the Muslim Brotherhood. This is a guy who said it is the duty to suicide bomb. Duty, his words, in Iraq and, and, and Israel. Well, he called it Palestine, but that's not real. Right? Suicide bombing. This is the guy who legitimized suicide bombings against innocent civilians. This is the guy who put the fatwa out basically saying that um, suicide bombing is legitimate. And he's the reason why the Muslim Brotherhood is able to claim that they're nonviolent because they will say, oh, we don't uh, advocate for violence against civilians. No, 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 no. But Yusuf Karadawi will just say, no, no, no. Israel's, Israelis and Jews and, you know, the American imperial system, anyone who supports that system isn't really a civilian. So if you blow up a baby, if that's a Jewish baby in Israel, well, it's not really a baby. That's an armed combatant because Zionism is whatever, whatever, whatever. Therefore, you can blow up a school bus. This is Yusuf Karadawi. Yusuf Karadawi was considered a terrorist by Saudi Arabia. The Grand Mufti of Saudi Arabia thinks he's an insane person. So when the Grand Mufti of Saudi Arabia agrees with me, let's all take a moment to pause and reflect on that one. Then you have the fact that he was living in Qatar for years. And this is something I always hammer is, what the hell is up with Qatar? What are they doing? So Karadawi was out in Doha. And remember, Karadawi is the spiritual leader of the Muslim Brotherhood. Karadawi is a man who thinks suicide bombing is a duty. He is a man who is considered a terrorist in many other Arab countries. Yet, he gets asylum in Qatar, one of the wealthiest countries in the world. All they have is gas and slaves. It's true. And they're going to get the 2022 World Cup. Woo! So Qatar, slave-based gas company, was sheltering Yusuf Karadawi. They also are the place that shelters Gaza. Sorry, Hamas. The leaders of Hamas don't want to live in Gaza. They want to talk about Gaza. But they want to live in a five-star hotel in Qatar. So this is that. So I think it's... I, I want to bring this up and let you know that Yusuf Karadawi is dead. One, so you can, you know, high-five someone. But two, just so you know, okay, you've probably never heard the name before. Maybe if you've watched all my shows, you're like, yeah, Yusuf Karadawi, Saeed Kutub, you know, Hassan al -Banna, I got it. You know, Muslim Brotherhood guys. I'm with you, Daniel. But if you're not a regular and you're just watching this now and you're like interested in stuff, I would advise you to sort of jot down the name Yusuf Karadawi and just see over the next week if there's any organizations or prominent people, some Omar al Gabra types maybe, who seem like they're condoling, you know, Yusuf Karadawi, oh, a great, you know, austere religious scholar. See who says what about Yusuf Karadawi, because that will be an excellent indicator to you to see who supports radical Islamic terrorism. Because Yusuf Karadawi is a man who thinks it is a duty to suicide bomb people and issued the fatwa explaining why blowing up a bus full of Jewish kids is not really terrorism. And I'm glad he's dead. So, I'm sure you are too. That's going to bring us to the end of this week's episode. Thank you so much for watching. You know, I've been me. You've been you. We've been ourselves. So, if you like the show, please, you know, like the video, share the video, subscribe to the whatever, do the thing. You know, get a tattoo of my face onto your face. All the usual things. Uh, you'll look great for Thanksgiving. And I will see you next week. <laughs>